As a child, my hobbies for building things became a passion. At 10, I'd ride my bike to construction sites and for hours study and stare at the cuts in the rafters, electric lines, and plumbing. When I was a senior in college, I bought an old house on the outskirts of Macomb, Illinois at an auction for $7,900, and after graduating, we built it with a bank loan for $15,000. For 16 months, I gutted the interior, raised the roof, built an addition, sided the barn, and sold it for $27,000. As unprofitable as this project was, it was cathartic. I needed and wanted so badly to do this, it was near spiritual. I was completely into the physical. I returned to Chicago, started studying for the CPA exam, but quit and started the business of restoring exteriors of high-rise buildings, which I still do. I was attracted to this line of work because it's of course physical, but also seasonal. I usually only work six months out of the year, which allows time for personal projects. After 10 years in the business, I became better at bidding and started making more money and considered building a house. That idea lacked motivation because I already did that. So when I saw Chester and Edith's incomplete boat, thought this would be, for any builder of things, the ultimate project. I wanted one more physical project, then I was going to give up working with my hands and try something different. The hall was going to become the property of the boatyards in less than 24 hours and I had to think hard and fast. If I changed my mind, the mistake could cost $10,000. Not the most money, but enough. The next day, on November 16, 1991, I gave Edith a money order and an extra $250 for the Miller Welder, and I now own this amazing vessel. Standing under it, being in it, knowing it was mine, seeing what Chester had done, thinking what had to be done, was as powerful a feeling as I ever had. My passion for this project was so strong and lasted so long, I consider myself lucky in life to have been able to have experienced that. I would come to the yard to work on the boat no matter what the weather. One day it was five degrees and the yard manager asked me what I was doing there. Was I crazy? One of the great things about this project was I've never built a boat before and had to learn as I went. When I called the Miller repairman about my broken welder, he came out not to fix it but to show me how to weld. As long as you're paying me for a service call, let me teach you something, he said. He said a weld is stronger than the steel itself, so I placed two welded plates on blocks and jumped on it, and the weld held just fine. I read some books on the subject and practiced, and soon became good at it. The thing about building with steel compared to house materials is it takes 10 times longer. The nine feet I added to the back, which included a waste tank and fuel tank, took five months, with the last three weeks of welding the seams 100%. Welding the interior hull and shorts resulted in some serious shin burns, but it was learning as you go. The toughest part of the project was lining up the shafts through four sets of bearings so not to vibrate, and angling the engine so the shaft and engine coupling met perfectly flush. Whenever I would weld the V-support, which held the shafts, the piece would shift when the molten would cool. For every step there's a problem and a solution. I called the guy who made the shafts for information so many times I became embarrassed. I hired Imperial Crane Company to lift the engines into the boat, but there was some plating in the way preventing the engines from seating on the mount. When I told the crane operator to raise the engine up two feet, I had to crawl under to cut something and not take your foot off the brake, he laughed and said the crane's hydraulic, there is no brake. I installed the hydraulic steering pump and lines, through haul fittings, strainers, engine mufflers, built the gas and water tank, top floors, installed the doors, sandblasted the outside metal and inside metal below the water line, bonded and primed the outside, and mounted the props. Five years into the project, the boat far from complete, with the electric, plumbing, the interior walls yet to be finished, it was ready to be launched. Dan Reich and his wife inherited this boatyard from their Uncle Ernie, and within six years, through mishandling everything, including the customers, was closing because the yard was now half empty. My rent went from $300 to $700 in one month, and the price to move my boat 300 feet to the slip with their 60-ton travel lift was going to be $10,000. These pseudo-Christians were extortionists.
called Imperial Crane, and to hire two of the largest cranes for a day would be $4,500, and the boat would have to be moved to the slip. I went to a truck junkyard and bought two rear-end semi-tractor trailer wheels, all 16 tires held air, and welded these to the sides of the hull. I welded six large steel casters to the front cradle, which was holding this boat up, and my plan was to get a garbage truck or something with a very low first gear to tow it. Dan Reich, to counter this, moved many of the abandoned boats to block my path. A few days before the yard was to shut down, we agreed to a launch fee of $3,000. Even though everyone said the lift was too old and poorly maintained for the hydraulics to pick it up and drive it 300 yards to the slip, it did, and it was wonderful. I called everyone for the launch, my parents, Edith, and friends. To my amazement, of the hundreds of things that could have gone wrong with this maiden voyage, nothing did. The boat was smooth, steady, and watertight. I took this boat to the north branch of the Chicago River, just south of Bond's Boatyard, where the notorious Billy Dickens had squatted a section of riverbank and rented to a half dozen boaters. For 300 a month, electric concluded, I continued the work and finished the plumbing, electrical, installed the top and front hatches and railing system. I built a thermostatically controlled wood-burning firebox and installed the off-grid electrical system with a large 1440 amp battery bank. This would give me the freedom to live without shore power. Three years later, the city shut his operation down. I wasn't there, but as the story goes, a Chicago police vessel went past too fast, creating a wake, and Billy Dickens went into a tirade, screaming out obscenities, not realizing a high-ranking city official was on board. There were other squatters and a factory owner who had built a very nice dock. All now history.